Thursday, Friday, Saturday series. Thought it was going to rain. It looked like they were going to put the tarp on during batting practice, but a lot of that weather has moved out of the way. Still the potential of it coming later, but right now, sunshiny skies, 85 degrees here in Gainesville, and the wind blowing in just slightly from left center field. So sit back, relax, and enjoy some college baseball. Big, big matchup as the third-ranked Tennessee Volunteers will try to win here in Gainesville. Cags ready to go, so are we. And the first pitch is perfect. Fastball right down the heart of the plate at 632. Christian Moore likes to bob his head a lot. He is very uh, enthusiastic in the batter's box. And that is a good changeup right there. And BT, I think that's been the difference with Cags this year, throwing that changeup. Yep, talked about it over and over. When he's on, his changeup's on. It's really good extension down the mound, and everything plays off of that. Another changeup and a slow roller. This is going to be a tough play. Cags off the mound, though. Throw is a little wide of the bag, and Heyman unable to hang on to it. So, well, they're going to call a base running interference as he was inside the bag. We've seen this happen to the Gators several times this year, and Tony Vitello is irate coming out of that third base dugout. You know, if I'm Tony Vitello, that is a tough call. I mean, the rule is, is the run. The runner has to establish the baseline inside at the 45-foot mark, be inside the baseline, and, you know, that's just a tough play. It's tough for the umpire to call. It's tough to make that call, and that's tough for everybody, honestly. Well, this happened to the Gators just last week, and you can see where he's running. Yeah. They're yeah. going to call you out every time on that play where it is. It's, it's weird in the game of baseball that the base is in fair territory, so a straight line from the batter's box would be straight down the line towards the base. However, the rules state if there's a collision, you have to be to the right, which is, happens to be a collision. Yeah, that's, that's what's going to happen every time. So, like you said, the Gators got burned with that last week, and they uh, get rewarded with it this week. So, Tony Vitello has calmed down. He understands that the call was right after the review. And he gives the guy a high five for squibbing a bunt. And that was a tough situation, but watching Cags bounce off the mound right there to be able to get there in time and make a play is, is pretty Im impeccable. So, you know, covered up by a, a crucial play there, but really good job by Cags. Yeah, shows you how athletic he is, and that has certainly ignited that Tennessee dugout. They are chirping at the very top of it as the first pitch, a breaking ball that didn't do much, hits Blake Burke, and Tennessee's going to have a base runner anyway. It's so important for Tennessee because they really didn't swing the bats all that well, at least comparative to what their stats said coming in. So it's going to be important for them to strike early in this ball game. I think the more the Gators get the momentum, they'll carry it over from yesterday's ball game. So Caglione to the stretch, and a first pitch change up to Billy Amick is good for strike one. Yeah, that combio, there it is again. And to your Great point pitch. there, Nick, the Tennessee Vols, they really haven't swung the bat well the last two games, and that's exactly why they tried to get Kavaris tears in today in the DH spot. Coming off a little hip stuff right now, but really need him in there to, to provide that power that they need. And it actually really goes a little further than that. You, you look back to last week, they beat Missouri just twice 3-2. Three to two. Three to two, so they right. didn't swing the bat. They yeah. lost to Lipscomb. Yeah. It was their first midweek loss all season. So they came into Gainesville struggling a little bit, swinging the bat. And Amick misses badly there. To your point, three of their last four SEC games, they've only scored three runs. Amick hit a towering home run yesterday in the eighth inning to make it a one-run game. That was on a fastball. He has not gotten one from Caglione here. One, two, another changeup, and he'll head back to the dugout. Just established the changeup right now. We talk about it all the time. We just talked about it a few seconds ago, but he's just continuously doing, and I think Cag's going to continue to do it until the Vols figure out how to hit it. I mean, that pitch, you talk about tunneling, that pitch looks like it's going to be a fastball outer third. The hitter's going to go get it, and all of a sudden just dives off at the end of the table at the end. So now, even though a lefty is on the mound, Kavaris Tears is going to make his first start of the weekend. So left-on-left -left matchup, and that one's chopped right to Shellnut. He'll gobble it up, throw across in plenty of time, and that will retire the Tennessee Vols. Andrew Seacrest. Yeah, and he's not going to wow you. 90-91, that's going to be his top out. Great changeup, though. His combi is good. Curve slider. And how about this? They have not lost the game he has pitched in this year. So very similar to what? The Gators have done with Jack Caglione on the mound, so it should be a really good battle between a couple of lefties. And the interesting part, BT, and, and maybe you can explain this, Florida struggled in the first game yesterday against guys throwing 90-91. 
but they're able to hit 95, 96. So mm -hmm. it seems like it would be the opposite, but it does seem like the slower throwers have really kept this Gator offense uh, off balance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're very comfortable with things that you see all the time. So the Gators are built with those hard throwing guys. You see guys in the league throwing hard throwers. So it's they're almost unicorns in the league now where you have, you call them thumbers, where they're a little bit slower. They mix it in and out of the zone, a little bit slower pitches and bigger discrepancies between pitches. It's tougher to hit for yeah, sure. Yeah, we brought up yesterday the Carson Finvold game oh, yeah. where he came in, you know, thumbing it up there. And it's, it's, a, it's a game in Gator lore. It will go on forever. Well, I think you, you can look back at a lot of big games over the years where those guys have been able to keep hitters off balance. So Curlin back in the leadoff spot, and he almost gets hit with a first pitch breaking ball. That one floats in there at just 71 miles an hour. Curlin had a good day yesterday. A couple of hits in the second game, a couple of hits in the first game. He's got four singles so far this weekend. And that went a little bit high for ball two. 367 in the on-base percentage. And one thing we know about Curlin, he's not afraid to get hit with the pitch 12 times this year. There's a fastball, and it's a good one at the knees for the first strike of the game. Curlin is now hitting nine of the last 12. The average starting to creep up. It's at 267 now. And another breaking ball is fouled off down the third base line. Win not really a factor at all today for these two teams that hit a lot of homers. Just kind of sitting there and has been coming in throughout most of what we saw before the game. Now the 2-2, and Curlin stays alive. He's done a better job of being able to now go to right field, and I think that has made a difference. And that's really the strength of his game at the plate anyway, is kind of staying through the middle of the field, right center field gap, that's kind of his target, and you know has battling a little bit of a hand thing too, so it's hard to pull the ball with his top hand. And there he goes. Right center field gap. That'll go shopping. And that's a good job by the right fielder to slow things down. But Curlin gives the Gators a good start. And this is what Curlin was doing at the beginning of the year. It, and it just kind of fell off. And right now, this is coming in at the right time with this Gator team. Him at the leadoff spot going with it. Pitches outer third, keeps his hands back, and barrels it up. Nice job of hitting. You can see right there, shoulder. Hips, everything, thighs, right where that ball was going in right center. So Tennessee will shift on Jack Caglione. First time all year that we've seen a team basically take five guys and make them outfielders. And Cags hits it right to where the shift was, and the shortstop, Dean Curley, will haul it in. You know, to me right there, they're in the shift with Cags, and you, don't, you can't do it now, but they're in the shift so far over. Cade Curling can get off a little bit and really get a good jump to go to third base right there and steal a bag. There's no way that they were to back pick and the guys occupying the base to be able to throw Curling out on a back pick. I think he kind of missed there, but plenty of game left with Seacrest still pitching. Yeah, Caglione yeah, stays it, aggressive. And one of the things you have to worry about, though, with the left-handed hitter up to the, the catcher's throw to third base, plus, you know, with nobody out, it's a little chancy. So now Ty Evans moves down a couple of spots from where he's been hanging out the last month or so in the leadoff spot, and he'll drill one deep to left field. Dryling is going to look at it, but he's going to run out of room in a hurry. And right at the top of the berm, Ty Evans gives the Gators a 2-0 lead with lucky homer number 13. You can see the Gators offense have a plan right now. They're really attacking that off-speed stuff that Seacrest has all in his arsenal up and down the board. He's shown it over and over and over. So the Gators really do have a good plan right now of maximizing it in the first inning. There it is right here. And he's going to keep his hands back on this hanging slider. And he knew it as soon as he hit it. This ball is attacked and buggy whipped to left field over to the berm area. It's the eighth homer that Seacrest has given up this year. It was 100 miles an hour off the bat, distance of 414, and the Gators an early 2 0 lead. How about that, Sully? Two for two in, in changing of the lineup. Curlin getting on at the leadoff with a double, and Evans here batting in the three hole. Yeah, how about that? The home run, outstanding. Well, yesterday was the first game as Shelton hits one into the shift. Moore will come in and get it. 
Yesterday was the first game all year that the Gators got a lead in SEC play and never relinquished it. So for the first time, they led from wire to wire in winning the 4-3 to three decision in that second game of the doubleheader. So we'll see if they can do it again in back-to-back -back days. The pitching was outstanding yesterday in that mid-relief for the Gators. I mean, what Liam Peterson did, you know, what, what Fisher Jamison did, incredible stuff. Tyler Shelnut now the hitter. A little tardy on a 89-mile-an-hour fastball. Senior from Lake City's got 12 homers and a 256 batting average. A couple of hits in the series. He's laid on another fastball for strike two. And that's one thing to look at, too, is, you know, as a fan looking at that, he's like, oh, he's only throwing 88, 89 miles an hour. How do you, you know, you're laid on a fastball. Well, he's so used to seeing all these slow stuff, the, even the slower guys that throw it looks a little bit harder. And that is three. They're saying, let's go. And you can see Kevin O'Sullivan in the in the background there saying, let's go. And the first pitch a little bit low for ball one. Chris Smith has his head in the dugout. A lot of chirping here in the early going. A great crowd here at the Condren Ballpark today. Both of these teams know the importance of this game. Tennessee still in contention to try to win the overall league race. Arkansas and Kentucky have split their series after Kentucky came back and won today. Good fastball by Cags, and he's quickly ahead of Dryling, a ball and two strikes. And a breaking ball that hung is going to be deposited into straightaway center field. So Dryling with a leadoff hit, and Tennessee has their first one of the day. So the fastball and the changeup have been good by Caglione. That breaking ball, not so good. He had to maneuver through a, a lot of traffic in Arkansas last week. Razorbacks had a couple of guys on in each of the first two innings, but Caglione able to wiggle out of it. Here's the freshman shortstop, Dean Curley. And the first pitch to him a little bit low on a changeup. Athletic kid we saw make some plays yesterday defensively. Swung the bat pretty good. Yeah, he's a big guy for his shortstop. With a really strong arm. Another change up and a swing and a miss. We'll even up the count. And they Talk didn't hand him the shortstop job either. He came in and Tony Vitello said, there's four guys were vying for it. And he just won it out as a freshman. It's from California. And we'll take that fastball in. And not only defensively ha has he been good and showed off that arm. He's second among freshmen in the league and Doubles, RBI, and slugging percentage. Similar body to Josh Rivera. Josh starting to heat up uh, in double A. Had some back-to-back -back good nights. Another changeup is fouled straight back. And Josh is not playing too far away from Knoxville. Sevierville, Tennessee yep. Smokies, starting shortstop at double A. That closed stance by Curley as he gets right on top of home plate. And this one is a souvenir about five rows in just past the Gator dugout. Talked about it a lot yesterday, too, but these balls have been unbelievable with two strikes. I mean, they have countless hits. I think they had double digit between the two games yesterday, two strike hits. You had another one this inning to start out the inning by Dryling. Look to see it. You know, that's a factor in the game as well. How many times can Cags put the guys away with two strikes off a team that's done, you know, had a lot of success with two strikes? Here's the pitch, and it's a fastball chop right to Curlin. He'll flip it to Shelton for one. Throw is good, and pitcher's best friend will retire a couple of Tennessee Vols here in the second inning. You can see Cags has definitely leaned on his off-speed so far, and I think Curley was thinking the exact same thing. Got a fastball in the inner half a little bit late, jammed him, got a perfect 4-6-3 tailor-made double play for the Gators. And that had to be a good feed because Curley runs well down the line. Shelton on the back end. What a good toss. The first catch loves it. So two outs now for Hunter Ensley, and he'll foul off a fastball. This would be a great shutdown inning for Cags if he can get it, get this crowd in. This could be a big crowd here tonight. 
little overflow from the great softball game earlier. Yeah, walk-off win for the Gator women over Texas A&M. Now have clinched that series. It was senior day over there today. Yeah, and that basically means that they will be ensured the, the two seed at the that SEC is, tournament. That is correct. Another breaking ball by Caglione, not so good, but the changeup has been really good. This one out to Curlin again. He'll come get it. Fire over to first in time, and side is floor went up to Knoxville last year and took two out of three. One thing that sticks out to me, too, is the last two meetings between these two schools, the away team has won and has really taken advantage of, you know, the deficiencies in the offense of the home team the mm -hmm. last two years. So interesting to see what's going to happen this year, too. Here's Brody Doné. Takes ball one and now ball two. Kevin, and, Kevin O'Sullivan, 27 and 22 all time against the Vols. The only team he's got a losing record against is Arkansas. Pretty special what Sully has been able to do. Doné lines one, but right at the center fielder, and Hunter Ensley barely has to move for out number one. Well, Xander Secrets, the lefty, was born a righty. But when he was two years old, he broke his arm, his right arm. And from that moment on, he became a southpaw. Yeah, I, I tried to tie my son's arm behind <laughs> his back for several years. It didn't work. Make him a lefty. They've just got life easier when it comes to baseball, at least. Heyman pops one a mile high out to the first baseman. Blake Burke will stare up into that blue sky and haul it in for out number two. I'll tell you, if you're trying to find golf clubs being a lefty, it's not easy. Yeah, that's the hard part. <laughs> that is not easy. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of left-handed baseball players that actually play golf right-handed. Mm -hmm. And all the hockey players play left-hand. Yeah. The use of that slap shot. Speaking of lefties, here's one, Hayden Yost. Looking for his first hit of the weekend, though. But he's been robbed several times. He uh, has certainly swung it better than what the stats say. Freshman from Tampa entered this weekend with a five-game hitting streak, but 0 for 8 with three strikeouts against the Volunteers. A fastball off the plate. Yeah, Hayden Yost went to uh, Sickles High School about four miles from Tampa Bay Downs where domestic product won the Tampa Bay Derby. And they'll be running in today's derby. Yost puts a little charge into that one, but Ensley will have plenty of room to go over and get it. And that is an easy one two -er as the Gators with a 2 0 lead. And Jack Caglione will get back to work. 8 9 and 1 will come up for the Tennessee Volunteers. And the first pitch changeup is in there to Colby Backus. Backus is from the same hometown as. Steve Spurrier, Johnson City, yes. Tennessee. There's a fastball, and that one is a little bit inside. I have something in common with the, with the old ball coach. We were both born at St. Francis Hospital in Miami Beach. How about that? Yeah. That change up a little low. And Chris Smith having a conversation with Colby Backus. He's a 435 hitter. And he misses a changeup. Boy, that pitch has just been dialed in from the get go. He's making just his third start of the year, but he's 10 for 23 at the plate with four homers. Another changeup. And Cag says, head back to that third base dugout. Yeah, Cass got really good comfortability with this changeup right now, as you can see. Maybe not so much with his fastball on his slider, a little bit more erratic, but hopefully he can dial those two in to really build his arsenal and use all of them as time goes on throughout the game. Now the nine-hole hitter, Cal Stark. He's from Knoxville, so he got to stay in town and go to college as Caglione backs him off the plate. And you've seen coaches do this through the years. You get a guy out there with a great changeup say left-hander, you start putting lefties in the line mm -hmm. to negate it because sure. that takes away the guy's best pitch. I know Pat McMahon used to do that all the time. There's that changeup again. But how hard is that when you're watching film and you're saying, man, this guy can throw it 98, 99, so you're probably in your mind 
saying, I've got to hit a fastball, and then sure. he just keeps throwing that thing up there. Oh. For me, you have to cheat one pitch. It's whatever he's throwing the most that day or whatever is your strength. If you're a fastball hitter, go up there and cheat a fastball because you can't hit every single one of his pitches that he's throwing. He throws 98-mile-an-hour fastball and a 78-mile-an-hour changeup. That's too big of a difference. Now the one-two. They come fastball, and that one is lined straight back where it came from. That'll fall in front of Jalen Guys. So fastball and the breaking ball have gotten hit. Changeup not so much, and that's the second hit of the day for the Volunteers. So there you go. Stark a little bit early on the changeups. Obviously, Backus was as well. Came up there hunting a fastball, and he got it right down the center cut of the plate. And another two-strike hit by the Vols. Both of them today have been that. And both of them straight back up the middle. So a good approach. That's what Christian Moore has done this weekend. He's got several hits right back up the middle. Had two singles in the first game yesterday. And then two more singles in the second game. And all four of them basically went over the bag at second base. Another change up. And, and that's that a sign is of a good the hitter. That's a really good sign of a good hitter is that you don't always have your power numbers every single weekend, but to have the ability and the willingness to just hit the ball up the middle and do a job for your team, get on base, shows the maturity that Moore's had in his junior year now. And time called at the plate by Brody Donay. Yeah, Moore has 14 homers in league play. The next best for Tennessee is nine. And, of course, the 20 overall. Been a special season for Christian Moore. There's a fastball, and it's fouled straight back. Got him set up for the change here. Showed him the fastball at 94. Let's see if Moore makes the adjustment. He's reached base in 11 straight games. And the one, two, there is the change up. Hit right to Heyman. He'll go to second for one, throws a little high, so that's going to mess up. The ability for Shelton to throw, and then he throws it straight into the Gator dugout. Yeah, it's one of those where maybe you put that in your pocket. It was a slow developing play because of the spin on the ball having to go all the way from first to second. You got a fast runner going down the line as well. And you always, you don't want to make one mistake turn into two. And not that that was a mistake because it was an out at second base, but a high throw. Tough to come back and make another really good throw back to first base, especially with Hammond moving back towards the bag. That's the one you just want to put in your pocket. Absolutely, Nick. Yeah, he couldn't step into it at all. And that gives Tennessee a two-out runner in scoring position for Blake Burke. And a change up to him for strike one. Burke was hit by a breaking ball on the first pitch that he saw. That 391 batting average, third best in the league. And a very tough out as Caglione misses off the plate with a fastball there. Another fastball, and Burke misses it. Just straight cheese against cheese. Here's my best. See what you got. Here's the one two, and it's chopped foul. 96 mile an hour fastball that time. It's a big at bat in this game. A base hit here possibly scores a run, gets Tennessee dugout in their momentum going. And out here gets this crowd going crazy, keeps the Gators momentum going on their side. Yeah, especially because when you look at Tennessee and what they've done all weekend, it's really just been the top of the That's order. Right. Yeah. So I mean, this, this is one guy that, that's been they, delivered. Yeah, they have to produce. Here's another one two pitch, and it's fouled off again. Another it, one at 96. And it's going to get to the point as the game unfolds where the, the pressure is going to mount on Moore and Burke to get it done because they're not getting help down the, with the rest of the guys. Think about this. In the two games yesterday, they struck out 29 times. I mean, that's incredible. They've been averaging, what, just around nine strikeouts a game. One, two, change up. And Burke does a good job of laying off of it. Which, with a power hitting team like Tennessee, that's kind of what you tend to see with a bunch of power hitters is you have a little bit higher strikeout numbers. 
but you run out of, run the ball out of the yard to make up for it. But Tennessee has been a really all-around sound baseball team offensively. Another fastball, and that one is by Burke and Caglione. If he has that. The breaking ball is a work in progress, so he's pretty much fastball dominant guy, a transfer from Wichita State. Seacrest went four innings against Missouri last weekend, gave up a couple of runs. His shortest outing in SEC play this year was the two innings at Auburn, where he gave up three hits and three runs. I don't know. Coach V may not have liked what he had seen out of uh, Seacrest. I talked before the game, and I said, well, what are you thinking on Seacrest? He said, well, we're going to ride him as long as we can. Uh, but... I guess uh, he didn't like the swings the Gators were putting on him. Yeah, I guess they didn't want him facing him top of the order again. So it'll be 9-1-2 and two for the Gators. There you see Tony Vitello. A couple of 50 win seasons. And a great winning percentage there now in his seventh year. Amick will play even with the bag as Guy comes to the plate. And takes a fastball high. That one uh, really high, velocity-wise, 101. Yeah, as advertised. So there's the, the difference. You got a somewhat of a softer lefty as Guy chops this one to second. No problem for more. And the sidearm toss over to first is in plenty of time. You know what's interesting, too? A guy that's throwing over triple digits, you would think if you look at his stat line, that the strikeouts would be astronomically high, just blowing it by people. That's not really the case. You know, 46 innings, 37 strikeouts. That, that's not something you would predict out of a guy throwing 100 to 101 mile an hour. You would think at this level, it'd be a lot higher. Here's Kate Curlin. Completely agree with you, Nick. But sometimes, I mean, you know as a hitter, if you know something's mm -hmm. coming, you can cheat it. I mean, the difference between knowing what's coming and not knowing what's coming is pretty crazy for a bunch of really good hitters. So if they know a fastball is coming, if that's what he's going to throw predominantly, yeah. you know, majority of the time, it's a lot easier to hit no matter how fast it is, but it is still 100 miles an hour. But I'm taking into consideration some of the non-SEC competition he's right. faced, and I would think he would dominate some of those teams. For sure. That one way off the plate for ball three, and Cal Stark is taking a deep breath, encouraging Nate Sneed to do the same. Need taking a while now ready and there is a strike but <laughs> it does seem like too and, and I, I completely agree with your point because you guys have all this technology now and you go to these hitting facilities you can set the pitching machine on a hundred so you, you can go get used to seeing those types of pitches absolutely not only seeing that he throws you know 75 plus percentage fastballs out of all the pitches that he throws but that he only throws 20% strikes with his off-speed pitches. So it's like, I'm going to eliminate his off-speed pitch. If he spins me one over for a strike, that's okay. We'll move on to the next one because majority of the time, you are going to get a fastball down the middle of the plate more times than not, and that's what you're looking to hunt and hit anyway. Steve's got a good job of coming back. Back in the count now. Three balls and two strikes. As Curlin gets ready, and he chases 96 up in his eyes, so there is a strikeout. And I'm going to counter what both of you guys are saying. You look at any of the big league pitchers that are out there right now that are throwing 100 or higher, their strikeouts, and you're talking about going after big league hitters, are way above innings pitch. So that, that's why, again, and you can see it right there, that ball exploded at triple digits. But here's Caglione. And a breaking ball right back our way, but a little too high. You know, you set a pitching machine at 101. You know where it's coming from. You don't have to deal with the, the, the delivery, where the arm angle's coming, and actually the heat of the moment of the game. That all comes into play when you're trying to hit this live. That went in, and we'll even up the count after a 101 mile an hour fastball misses in off the plate. Caglione lined to the shortstop who was playing shallow center field his first time up. Trying to come in again, and it'll miss. Looks like he's got a little cutter at, you know, a little bit less than 100 at like 94, 95. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's the breaking <laughs> ball. They say it's a That'd work, be nice. he's a work in it progress. Over. Yeah. And that one will catch the inner part of the plate at 98. And that's if you're going to beat Cags at all, it's going to be right on his inside knee or on his hip in there, where the front door two seamer is what we call it. So. And they keep trying to do that. You saw the, the stats there 
when he's been on the mound. Six homers this year when he's been the starting pitcher. 421 overall batting average. That's not easy to do, folks. And, of course, working on that 25-game hitting streak. And that'll extend to 26 with a line drive right back up the middle. So Kags turns around 98, and he is now four away from the UF school record. That's exactly what Kags is trying to do right there. Got a bunch of pitches in on his hands, in on his hip right there, and wait for the pitcher to make a mistake over the plate. And when he does it, don't miss it. Don't do too much with two strikes. Well, hit a ball 100-plus back at him. Yeah, that's a that's 101 with some run on it, and he was able to barrel it up. That's a, a little glimpse of what you're going to see at the next level from Mr. Kags. So now Ty Evans. And he's a little late on 100. Evans got a breaking ball on the first pitch of his first at bat and deposited it to the top of the berm in left field. 13th homer of the year. And Evans swings and misses again at a fastball. Talked about it earlier as well, kind of shaking up the top of the order right now, moving Curlin to that leadoff spot, taking Ty out, moving him to the three hole. Seems like he's kind of settled in a little bit more. It does a little bit more damage with guys on base, so it's really helped out Ty for sure. He only hit nine homers last year, and of course five of them came in the College World Series, and BT, I still think that's the most fascinating thing. Everybody that's ever played in college baseball in Omaha, Ty Evans has more homers in a single World Series than anybody. Very spectacular, and you know, This throw is going to get away, and that could be trouble. Caglione is going to round third and head for home. Right fielder's got some trouble picking it up, and a throwing error is going to give the Gators the third run of the game. Billy Amick just sailed one away from Blake Burke. And that's the second error of the weekend for Amick. And what did we talk about yesterday? Put the ball in play. Good things will happen. We saw it with Curlin last night. Putting the ball in play ended up being a run because of it. Get the ball in play. Good things will happen. He just airmailed him. Now, for me, the right fielder, I mean, as soon as that ball hit the third, he's got to be sprinting over. I thought he was a little late getting over there. And it happened to get tucked into that corner, so there wasn't a ton of ricochet there. And going back to your point on Ty. Yeah, going yeah, back on Ty, you know, it. For everybody sitting at home. Doing a lot of these other coaches that have developed players over the years. Here's Shelton. Goes after the first pitch, and that one's not handled by Burke. And Shelton's going to be safe. So another error by the Tennessee Volunteers. We'll keep this in and going. And that's a hot shot to first baseman at Burke right there. And Burke's been nails. We talked about it yesterday as well, the development that he's had on his defensive game. You know, that's something he just blocked off, just kicked off his chest and went the wrong way. Tough break for the Vols, but once again, putting the ball in play and seeing what happens, Nick. And, it, it, and the other thing, if you look at that play right there, the backup of there, just a little late getting over as well. Just assumed he was going to get it. Especially in the shift, too. He's kind of over that way anyway. Yeah. So we'll see if the Gators can take advantage of another error as Shellnut takes a fastball. And, that, and that's important. Make this hurt. Make these errors hurt. Put up a big, crooked number if you can that's demoralizing and you could do that, especially if it's self-inflicted. Shellnut is down in the count, no balls and two strikes. And you, know, you look at these middle guys in this order. You know, Shelton came in, hit the big homer yesterday, but he was not really driving in runs like expected. Shellnut's kind of been in that spot of late. He has driven in. Just over the last 21 games, he's got seven games where he's been able to drive in a run. And he'll pop this one up here. Should be an easy play for Christian Moore. He'll look up into the sunshine and make the catch to retire the side. Gators get just one hit, but a couple of times. So he has thrown 42 over the first three, and a lot of them like that, change-ups. He struck out Billy Amick the first time he faced him on those change-ups, and Amick swings and misses at one here. He has missed the baseball a lot. This weekend, Amick has struck out now five times. But he's also got 
several hits, and that change up right back up the middle. All three of Tennessee hits today are right back in front of Jalen Guy, the Gator center fielder. With that extra run tacked on, another shutdown opportunity here for Cags to keep that momentum in the Gator dugout. Tennessee got a leadoff single back in the second, but then Caglione was able to roll a double play ball. It was a one-out single back in the third, and Tennessee could not score. They have stranded a couple through the first three innings. Here's Kavaris Tears, the cleanup man today, and that one just off the plate for ball one. Tears top one to Shellnut, his first time up. Talked about yesterday, Tony Vitale compared him to Jared Dickey, which is a nice uh, compliment. Good change up there to even up the count at a ball and a strike. Tears another one of those guys that had to wait his turn. A very talented Tennessee team last year. Came in in, in minimal opportunities and then obviously making the most of his opportunity this year. Hitting 360 with double digit home runs. Fly ball to center. Guy will drift over to left center. And just shy of this track he will stop and make the catch for out number one. Put a good charge in it. But Guy over there, fairly easy to make that play. And this is that tough time of night here at the Condren Ballpark where center fielders, right fielders have some issues. Yeah. See Guy Cent with his sunglasses on. Yeah, center, center fielders going to his left and then right field straight on. And you see what the sun's doing to everybody sitting out in those Adirondack chairs beyond the 380 sign in right center field. Here's Dylan Dryling. He's late on a first pitch fastball. And we have not seen the wind in this ballpark that much this weekend. It's starting to pick up to right field. Dryling singled his first time. Sophomore's hitting 316. And he takes the fastball right down the middle for strike two. That might have been one of those where he was expecting an off-speed pitch. And the Gators just doubled up on him. Now the 0-2, that one way off the plate. And that's crazy, too, with the with a bunch of the weather that's been popping up this weekend. You'd think the wind would be yeah. a little bit more of a factor, especially this time of year. It normally is, but really hasn't been. That one just got a piece of the bat. Seemed like the first couple of weeks of the SEC series that came in here, it was galing out mm -hmm. some, either it was left center, right center. It's, it was crazy. So now helping lefties. The pitch, another pop up. This one in the infield. Doné sheds the mask. He says he's going to get it, and he does. He's a little taller than Shellnut, who tried to steal it away, but it's out number two. They got a box out there. I guess Brody Dunneau did a little bit of pop-up priority with Mike Rivera before the game today after what <laughs> happened last night, but did a great job right there, throwing his mask out of the way, making it apparent that he's going to take the ball. Good catch. And the wind helped right there a little bit, keeping the ball in play, blowing out to right field, yeah, held it got, in. Yeah, the little backspin plus Here's the Mike Rivera. There's Mikey. Recent graduate, congratulations. Yeah, big time. Got his degree. See Taylor Black giving the defensive signals. Baby just uh, passed a, a year about old. A year old, yeah. Been daddy for about a year. So two outs now for Dean Curley. So on, on that play, what are you, you guys working on? Do they try to say, hey, catchers don't catch it? Or are they allowing you guys to, to take control if you feel like you've got it? So it's a little bit different. So the ones down the line a little bit more, obviously dependent on the shift now because that's such a big factor in what, what happens and who takes it. But anything – around that circle is yours all day long. You want to keep the pitcher away as, as much as possible. They don't work on it. Cags is a little bit different than that, but you really want to take that. And if the corner infielders call you off, it's technically their priority, so they, were, they would come and get it. It's a little bit easier for them coming in, but as a catcher, you want to take everything that you can, including bunts and anything right in front of the plate as well. Curley's the guy that grounded into a double play his first time, but Caglione can't throw him a strike here. It's a four-pitch walk. And a couple of balls on base here with two outs. As I talk to you, yep. if you feel that's the case. Yeah, would be a good way to do it. All right, Hunter Ensley, the hitter. And he'll take, change up a little bit low for ball one. I think more than anything, not so reading lips, Nick, as you know, but say you were to try to put a back pick or something on and you want to talk to the first baseman, you just don't make eye contact with him. You look at Cags and say, hey, Luke, I'm talking to you right here. Yep. 
Well that's six in a row now by Caglione that have not crossed home plate. He got Ensley to ground out to second his first time up. And this is again the bottom part of the order for Tennessee that has struggled throughout the series. And there is a change up for ball three so that's seven in a row now. Back is the hitter on deck. See if they definitely I would take one here. He does. And it is strike one. Ensley hitting just 194 this year with runners in scoring position. And a good changeup will bring the count full. So good job by Caglione after seven wide ones in a row. A couple of good pitches on the outer part of the plate. Now he'll try to finish off the inning. Here's the three two and we'll do it again. Caglione went four innings in his start last week against Arkansas. Five in the two starts before that. He'll try to finish off the fourth here. Another 3 2 pitch, and we'll do it again. Well, nice job breaking up a nasty pitch right there. And you got to expand the zone, especially this part of the game. Two outs, got a couple of men on base. Last thing you're thinking about is taking, taking strike three here. So this will be the eighth pitch of the at bat now. As Caglione comes set again, the pitch, fastball, popped him up. And we'll have a ninth pitch. So a ninth pitch to number nine. Good battle here with Hunter Ensley. And again, this is something that Tennessee has been doing a lot this weekend. We'll see who wins the battle. As Caglione comes set again, the 3-2 pitch. And that one is hit well down the left field line. Yost going back. Not going to get it. It's going to short hop the wall. One run will score. Here comes the relay throw to Shelton. He can't handle it. And a big, big double by Hunter Ensley with two outs and two strikes. Gets the balls a couple of runs. Another really good job with two strikes. Ten pitch at bat for Ensley right there. Got a fastball center cut down the plate. Did a lot of damage. Getting this game close. And this is a bad break the Gators get here because that ball just stays right stuck at the wall because it gets out there so quick. Yost has to go get it, and that made them decide to send the runner right there because I think bounces off the wall. They had no choice but to hold them up at third base. Even though there were two outs, it would have gotten on them really quick. So kind of a bad break. Well, Tennessee is going to send up a pinch hitter now. Colby Backus, the right fielder, will not get another at bat after striking out his first time. Robert Robin Vill Villanueva, a right-hander who has started 22 games, will come in and hit. Yeah, Backus, that was his first SEC start today. A changeup just off the plate for ball one. And here you got a, another guy hitting pinch hit opportunity, hitting over 300 with five home runs with an OPS of 1,000. So they have guys off the bench that are just doing damage. Better change up there, and that'll even up the count at one and one. Ryan Slater is going to be the first up out in the Gator bullpen. I would think he's a pinch hitter. That'd be a, a pitch you'd be vulnerable to the change it. But you're probably up there trying to just hack at a fastball. And there it was again for strike two. You're not in the flow of the game, so you're thinking, okay, I'm just going to put a charge in one. Your buddy just hit one off the wall. I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised to see him go back there again. They do, and it's down in the dirt. And you look at his stance. I mean, it looks like he's, he's uh, straddling the dugout here. He's so far away from home plate with that open stance. That's yeah, one of those... Uh, Stances that BT is going to use in the uh, beer league softball <laughs> when he starts playing in a few years. Change up again, got him, and that will retire the side. But Tennessee can resist the change. Not me. Mm -mm. Not I. I couldn't resist it. <laughs> Donay Heyman and Yost now a one-run game. So Nate Sneed back to work. Hard throwing right-hander. 
This one hit right back up the middle, but Moore with a nice backhand will throw out Dene, and he is retired for the second time tonight. And now this is an opportunity for Tennessee to throw up a shutdown point, keep the momentum in their dugout. So Gators need to counter here. I guess you, what you, BT, you call these guys rebound runs, right? Rebound runs, that's yeah, correct. They need them. Heyman steps in, 0 for 1. And a pop-up right behind the plate. Stark sheds a mask, and he's got it for out number two. Now it's time for Chuck Jerome to call that timeout right here. Talk to Hayden Yost. There you see Chuck. That's two quick outs. And here we go. On cue. Yeah, just three pitches. And more than anything, just want to give Caglione a little rest. And you can see Chuck there that he's got nothing that he really needs to say <laughs> no, or wants no. to say. Actually, right. he just looked over at uh, Josh Elander, who he coached at TCU. He was a player. He's the associate head coach for Tennessee and gave him a little nod. Just let him know what he's doing. <laughs> That's one of the cool, you know, dynamics within the game of baseball. Obviously, every sport, but definitely baseball, where some of the coaches have been in for so long now that you coach players, and those guys go into coaching as well, mm -hmm. and you compete against the guys that you coach. It's pretty cool. You know, now they call those what your player meetings. Obviously, and you get so many in a game, but back in the day, you just tell the guy to retie your shoe. Yep. Yos. Looked like he was taken until he got a strike, and now he's got one. 100-mile-an-hour fastball to even up the count at 1-1. One and one. Yost flew to center his first time. 0 for 9 in the weekend. He'll now take the, that one down low. Now the loophole in the system, Nick, is if you only have so many timeouts in the box in a game where <laughs> they say they just have something in their eye and yeah. they do it for no, a couple <laughs> seconds and get back in the box. There you go. My contacts. Yost pops one up. Moore will drift out into shallow right field and he's got it a very easy inning for Nate Sneed as the Gators go down quickly and quietly we'll head to the fifth game that he throws Caglione come into this game 5-0 and on the year and there's a swing and a miss to the nine hole hitter Cal Stark Stark singled up the middle off of Caglione the first time he faced him that was back in the third inning Tipped into the glove for strike two. And Cags desperately needs a quick inning right here. I mean, with an 18-inning day yesterday, he used a lot of bullpen guys. They're not as fresh today, including McNeely and Fisher Jameson. You really need a quick inning and go one more inning if you can. Well, Caglione gets a cleat stuck there. And that'll be ball one for a pitch clock violation. Oh. Just it looks slipped. like his back foot just slipped yeah. out. Size 16s. 1 2 is fouled back. So Tennessee continues to do a pretty good job today. After striking out a whole bunch yesterday, they're yeah. making more contact. And we've been talking about that. You know, get that pitch count up. That's the game within the game. 16 strikeouts in game number two yesterday. Game that the Gators won by one. They lead by one here, and there's another strikeout for Caglione. His fifth to get things started in the fifth. And that windup, when he's coming at you, you are selling out fastball right here because he looks like he's really putting something on it, and then he just takes it off and swing right through it. And I think you saw a little bit last inning as he threw a lot of pitches, got a little bit tired. He, tend to, he tends to drop his arm slot a little bit. Whenever he's really good, his arm slot's kind of a little bit higher. He's really down through the ball, down the mound. That's when he's at his best. So right there, he did a really good job of that. Back to the top of the order. Christian Moore misses a changeup. And that's the beauty of the changeup, too. I mean, the more you can throw, the, the, the more the more you can stay in the game. You'll be as, a little more fresh by doing it. it takes a little less effort. Another one for strike two. And Moore's looks like he's just talking to himself. <laughs> yeah. Saying, dude, I'm looking for 98. He's, he's seen a steady diet of those today. 
He's 0 for 2. And, and Caglione really hasn't thrown the, the breaking ball a lot. Missed on it early, and they've just stuck with the changeup because it's been working. But now a fastball, and that one is hammered right back into center field. So Moore continues to hit the ball right back up the middle. That's his fifth hit this weekend into straightaway center field. They're going to charge him rent there in center field. He's been living there all weekend, and he's been hitting it hard in that spot. Just another really good sign of a good hitter. It's like controlled chaos. It's controlled power, controlled hard swings, quick with two strikes, doesn't do too much, and get, finally gets the fastball that he's looking for, hits it right back up the middle. And, yes, he does need to be charged rent for hitting the ball to center field. So that's probably a sixth or seventh hit to center field this weekend. Now Blake Burke, left-on-left -left matchup, and that one is fouled back over our heads. How hard is it? You know, it's always a chess game, too, when it comes to pitching. And obviously, you're back there and calling with Kevin O'Sullivan. But when, when you throw five or six change-ups in a row, it's like, do you feel like, man, I've got to throw something else just to do it? Or do you just stick with it because you know that the opponent's not hitting it? That one to center again. Guy's going to drift back. And he'll have room to catch it just shy of the track. So Moore will retreat back to first base. It's definitely a little bit of both. You want to continue to do what's working. But good hitters tend to adjust, especially within a game and within at-bats. So, you know, a good hitter like Moore, I don't dislike the fastball right there at all, although he is a really good fastball hitting, you know, player. But you got to get in it, uh, up on his hands a little bit more because he starts to lean over the plate with the changeup, and that's really where you tie him up inside versus out over the plate. He can, he's quick enough, strong enough to be able to hit the ball back up the middle like he just did. Amick will take. A change up down low for ball one. We talk about all the accolades that Christian Moore. One of the things that he doesn't do, especially being at the top of the order, he's not a base stealer. Mm -hmm. Only one on the air and four attempts. He's been caught three times. Another fly ball to center. And Guy has been a busy guy. Makes a couple of outs this inning. And the one out single does not matter nothing yet. <laughs> all right, here's Jalen Guy in the nine hole. He almost gets hit with a first pitch fastball. I bet he wish he did for a second. Guy was the first guy to face Nate Snead a couple of innings ago, and he chopped one to the second baseman. Yeah, 31 pitches still throwing hard. He only threw seven pitches last inning. Very efficient. Oh, that one will miss up at 98. Guy is making his 18th start of the year. And he misses that one. Yeah, last year as a freshman at Wichita State, he was somewhere around 55 pitches. I'm sorry, 55 innings that he threw there. Says no to a couple of pitches, and now the 2-2, and they just stick with the hard stuff. And Guy will head back to the dugout for out number one. This ball's going to explode in on his hands. Almost looked like a little backup cutter right there at 93 miles an hour. Didn't really cut, just kind of stayed up. But hey, would, you know, that backdoor slider or backup slider and backup cutter is one of the harder pitches to hit in baseball. So now Kate Curlin back to the top of the Gator order. He misses a cutter. A double he hit first time up to right center field. Signs of good things to come. They tried again, and Curlin lays off of that off-speed pitch. That's yeah, his fifth hit of the weekend. Nothing bigger than that tack-on run last night. This one hit over to Amick. And the throw much better this time than the last one for out number two. And that was a really good at-bat. Last night, yeah, he had fouled off several pitches. Stayed alive and then just put it in play. And talk about put it in play, good things will happen. I'd like to see Cag's adjustment right here. Obviously got a hit last inning or two innings ago on a fastball out over the plate, but let's we'll see what he does a little bit more on the inside of the plate here. He again swings at the first pitch, got an off-speed pitch, and fouled it off. Not only the 26-game hitting streak, Caglione has now reached base in 33. Three straight games. His average up to 410. 
Well, is Jacob Young's uh, somewhere around 30? 30, right at 30. Right at it, yep. The Washington Nationals. Good pitch in. Get Cags to foul it off. And he sees creeping closer and closer to Matt Laporta. The amazing thing is how many years or that he's been here to put up those numbers. All right, tried to come in again, and that'll plunk him. So Cags on base, some booze throughout the crowd, but nothing intentional there, just trying to play baseball. And you mentioned Jacob Young. Yeah. As that one got him on that front leg. So last week against the Marlins, this is pretty yeah. crazy. And this is a stat after my own heart here, which yeah. you're about to read. First major league player with nine plus runs and six plus stolen bases in a single series since June of 1911. But he's got some crazy streak going where he hasn't been thrown out in X amount in a row. So, so 25 straight stolen bases to yeah. start off his career. There you go. The the most ever in Major League Baseball history is 29. So Jacob Young could do something that nobody else has done in the history of Major League Baseball. Go get him. And in the age of baseball where pitchers are so hitter-centric in the at-bat rather than holding base runners and actually – you know, controlling the game as much and the very high leg kicks because they're trying to throw as hard as they can. It definitely is easier to steal bases along with the big base, the <laughs> bases that you know well, that are out there now. Well, the bases are no longer 90 feet apart. Mm -hmm. That's it's crazy. As simple as that. I, I mean, Abner Doubleday is turning over in his grave at Arlington National Cemetery, may, I may add, because I've been to it. Wow. Yeah. 2-0 to number two, and Evans will pop one up. He hit a two-run homer his first time up and reached on a, a big error by Amick. He overshot the first baseman, and Caglione came around to score with two outs back in the third. Same exact situation as the Gators are in right now. And Evans will foul that one back to even up the count. So let's see that shot that Evans got. Hello. Kept his hands back. 414 feet estimated, 36 degree launch angle. And now the 2 2 pitch is hit down the right field line. That's curving and will be into the berm. BT, how do you feel about anybody over the age of 18 bringing a glove to the ballpark? <laughs> hey, if you're a true baseball fan, and you want to come to the ballpark and bring your glove and protect yourself or try to make a really good play and end up on the Sports Center top 10, I'm all for it. But you make a or better. Or use your beer. Yeah, you, can you make do that a better too. play if you're holding a beer and then you make and a, a one-handed catch. And, and a, baby. a baby. Yeah, there's been a, Keep adding on to it. some great ones over the years. Good pitch right there, and Evans is going to go down. They've got to throw him out, and Stark does it successfully to retire the side. So two more strikeouts for him. We really are. 4, 5, and 6 here for the Tennessee Volunteers. Gators trying to beat Tennessee in a series for the second straight year. Got him a couple of times in Knoxville. And a first pitch is strike one to Kavaris Tears. 0 for 2. He has grounded to third and flown to center. This will be the 85th pitch for Caglione. And it's a breaking ball that misses off the plate. Last time that Caglione went this long was the very end of March. Five and two-thirds against Mississippi State. Longest outing of the year was seven when he only gave up one run over seven innings in Baton Rouge. Two-one pitch is grounded foul and BT, I'm sure that, that start meant a lot to him after what happened at the end of the year last year. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, you know, as the last game of the year didn't have the start that he wanted, um, but, you know, really went in there and took it personal for himself and went out there and threw really well in Baton Rouge and has done that consistently throughout the entire year. Obviously, you know, right now 
in this game specifically. Ran his pitch count up a little bit two innings ago. Had a quick inning last inning. To be able to come into the sixth right here with a very, you know, bullpen that was heavily used yesterday in 18 innings that they played. So it was great for him. He needs to go out here and, and shut down right here. But he tries to throw a change up to tears and it misses off the plate. So it will be a leadoff walk. But I, I think that has been the difference. I think everybody knows his talent and, and everything that he can do, swinging a bat or throwing a baseball or even fielding a baseball. But the, the mind is, is such a big part of things. And his mindset, his ability to forget about the previous pitch or the previous whatever has been incredible this year. Here's Dylan Dryling. And Dryling hits one well down the right field line. Evans trying to chase it down, dives, and it's off of his glove, and it'll be a fair ball, says the first base umpire. So that's going to be a double, and the balls all of a sudden have second and third with nobody out. It's a heck of an effort by Evans right there. Really tough ball. I mean, the outfield shaded a little bit more to the left side with an inside-out hitter and Dryling, but... Yeah, caught it and touched it inside the baseline. He had for a double right there. Too. I mean, he, he had the crooked number get on the board, maybe get a strikeout, a pop up, or something like that, and get out with one. That's that's really the mindset you have to have. Gators will play the corners, even with the bags. Middle infielders back for the freshman shortstop Dean Curley. And the first pitch to him is fouled off on that Slater slider. Now let's talk about that, Jeff. So the runner at third, what has he been told? Well, the way they're playing it, even at third base, they're telling him, unless it's a slow roller, you're seeing it through. Now you're going if it's hit to the right side. You're only holding up if it goes to third. Swing and a miss for strike two. Good slider there puts Slater way ahead. And now you get greedy and try to get the strikeout. And pressure on Donay to block that ball if he buries one here. A deep breath and the 0-2 pitch way off the plate. And Slater doesn't like the baseball. Obviously he bounced that. Donay smothered it. And that's always the, the catcher's job. You know, even with a guy on third base, you want to bury an 0-2 pitch and make sure that guy back there does what he was supposed to. So now the 1-2, and it's down in the dirt again. Curly lays off of it. I like how he blocked that one a little better. The glove up. Yeah, I mean, as a catcher right now, it's all about really doing everything you got to feel yourself in your mind I'm a brick wall nothing's getting by me doing everything in my power to keep everything in front no matter how it's done 2-2 two -two pitch a little blooper down the right field line that'll be foul good piece of hitting right there that's a nasty slider he just got a piece of it so this goes back to that conversation like we had when Christian Moore was up there it was a lot of off speed pitches Cags ended up throwing a fastball where Moore got the hit do you still stick with the slider here? Absolutely. You need a yeah. strikeout right here. With your best pitch. Absolutely. Another 2-2 coming. And it is lined back up the middle again. That'll fall in front of Jalen Guy. And that one got too much home plate. And all of a sudden, we are tied at three apiece. Yeah, location got him there. Yeah, it was really one of the ones that kind of stayed up in the middle of the zone. Kind of outer third right down the kind of the center of the plate and just did a really good job of hitting it up the middle. Ball's got to be down a little bit more. I mean, I don't I don't want to give up a pitch and just bounce everything because you'll walk him, but walking him isn't the worst thing in the world. You needed a strikeout right there. Yeah, give a lot of credit to Curley there. He And we've seen him do it all weekend with the two strike foul balls. So now Hunter Ensley as Pierce Capola Continues to warm in that Gator bullpen. Ensley had the big hit off of Caglione. Two strike, two out double down the left field line, and he will take strike one. So it's been all sliders from Slater. Middle infielders at double play depth. Shellnut back to playing a normal third base. 
And there is strike two. First fastball caught the outer part of the plate. Well, when Tennessee had Tidwell there when they were pitching sensation, Ensley came in with him and had to redshirt a bunch of times through injury. Finally got his shot to play last year. So you talk about waiting your turn. Ensley's that guy. So Slater got up 0-2 on the last hitter. And 0-2 again this one. Run saver. Yep. Good job by Donay. Really good job by Donay. Not only keeping it in front, not allowing the guy from third base to score, but keeping it close enough to him to where the guy from first base can't get into scoring position where a base hit can score too. And get you out of that double play. Here's the one two and that one is hammered down the left field line. It's going to be another double for Ensley. Tennessee's got the lead by one and they're going to try to make it two. Here comes a relay throw and it's tardy and Ensley's having a heck of a day in the seven hole. Back to back doubles and he is now driven in four. I mean, for the Vols, it looks like the scouting report's out. Slater looks like and he's just going to spin sliders over and over. The Vols are hunting it for sure. Left one over the plate again. Hit the ball down in the corner for another for another double for Ensley. He's only thrown one fastball through two hitters. And the two balls that were hit didn't slide too well. So now Robin Villeneuve, he'll get his second at bat. Cag struck him out last time as he came up as a pinch hitter. So Caglione now in line for the loss as four earned runs, four of the five were his responsibility. This is coming from the dugout, just trying to bide some time to get Coppola loose. Oh, Kate Fisher's starting to throw now. And he just started throwing. Yeah, Capola is still down there tossing, but not on the mound anymore. So maybe with the Gators not having the lead, he'll save Capola, who got hot the other day and was walking in from the bullpen. Game was about to start. They were about to throw the ceremonial first pitch, and all of a sudden they stopped it, put the tarp on, and never played the rest of the day. Well, Noev is a guy from Quebec, was a hockey player. Actually led the JUCO ranks last year with 28 home runs and count them 102 RBIs. You mm. know, this guy's got pop. The one two is hit hard at his teammates. Yeah, you're thinking job one here is to get him over to third base by hitting the ball to the right side, but he's just up there wailing. Four straight volunteers have reached this inning. Slater trying to just get an out. Yeah, it looks like the Vols are just seeing Slater really well right now, and they're getting their swing off. They're not worried about the situational hit yeah. by any stretch right now. They're trying to get their swing off and do damage. Yeah, they're just letting loose it in the top button. Good take again for ball three. Well, that's one of those. If you get that call, it could be an inning changer. And there is a swing and a miss. So better slider there. Slater gets the first out of the inning. Looks like a corner fastball on the black and just dives right out of there. Gets him the bite. But you see the difference there on the balls that were hit and the one that wasn't yeah. hit. Location so important in the game of baseball for all you youngsters out there. You don't have to throw 95. You just got to mix up your pitches and put it in the right spots, just like we saw 
in game one from Tennessee the other day and what they were doing with with Stamos and then Causey coming in. Let's see if that unproductive out comes back to haunt him. Stark has been really good with runners in scoring position this year, 375. But he misses another slider. He's thrown his best sliders last couple pitches. Yeah, he's starting to get more comfortable with that pitch. Stark just a 258 overall hitter, though. He has singled and struck out today. And Jeff, you talk about location. I, growing up in Atlanta, was a huge Atlanta Braves fan. And, you know, growing up watching a little bit before my time, but Tom Glavin and Greg Maddox, mm -hmm. I mean, never once they overpower anybody, but boy, could they locate and get people out at a very effective clip. Couple of Hall of Famers. Hey, speaking of major leaguers, Christian Scott getting his start at Gator. And another Gator making it to the big leagues. Now the Mets have four Gators in their lineup. Yeah, pretty cool. And How about that? I need to roster. see it down yeah. in Tampa, yep. where I have a lot of friends and family at the Trop watching him do his thing. One two pitch. Fought off again. And Christian Scott played for the Gators, you know, back around what 2019, somewhere in there. But yeah, you call up from Syracuse where he was dominating, and he's he's added the sweeper to his repertoire, and he's he's saying that's what got him to the big leagues. Yeah, he was their best arm in AAA by far. Slater ready again, the one-two pitch off the plate. One of the few fastballs that he has thrown. Remember when Christian Scott threw the gyro slider? Mm -hmm. That was his pitch. Never got to play with Christian, but heard a lot of really good things about him. And obviously a great thrower of the baseball. Stark battling here. That one right off the end of the bat, but he stays alive to see another pitch. So another big leaguer for Kevin O'Sullivan. Mm -hmm. This will be the eighth pitch of this at bat. But how about that? Four members of the Mets roster are Florida Gators. Yeah, they don't have to change their colors. Came from that man right there, Kevin O'Sullivan. And to think that Sully's had two starting rotations in his tenure at Florida within, you know, the last decade of all three starting rotation guys could potentially either are or could potentially be big leaguers. And yep. Brandon Spro, Hurston Waldrop, and Caglione oh, now. Yeah. And then. And then. Slater faces four, giving up single, a double, got a strikeout, and hit her batter. There's strike one to Christian Moore. Leadoff man singled back up the middle his first time. It was his fifth single of the weekend. All right back up the middle. Fisher wide on a breaking ball. For me right here, the entire day Christian Moore has seen balls out or over over the outer third of the plate. He's kind of been leaning a little bit. I know he's a fastball hitter inside, but you got to show him something in to keep him off the pitches away. And that's what they try to do. Some more resets back in the box. With his 376 batting average and 20 home runs. There's a change up back up the middle again, and Curlin can't corral it. That'll trickle into center field. Sixth hit this weekend for Christian Moore, and the Vols keep coming here in the sixth inning. Maybe it's run control. Back the center field he goes. Well, his last at bat, we established that he needs to start paying rent. Now <laughs> the rent just went up. <laughs> It's crazy. I mean, he has just owned center field. And now it gets real dangerous. And now you look at this, and it's a lefty-lefty matchup, and you can see how it might play, you know, into the favor of the Gators. But Blake Burke does a really good job of hitting left-handed hitters, specifically the off-speed pitches. Well... Kate Fisher wanted to go from the windup, then stepped off and said, I'll go from the stretch. And the first pitch to Blake Burke is in there for strike one. 
Burke hitting 500 this year with the bases loaded. And 474 with runners in scoring position. So a guy that certainly has been good for Tennessee. But he's able to check his swing there, says the crew chief Jeff Head. Burke 0 for 2 today. I mean, whatever you do, you got to keep it down around his knees. Something that could possibly hit a ground ball. You get the two for one. He's only exactly, ground. Exactly what you want to do, but he is such a good low ball hitter. Well, the Tennessee dugout going to complain about that one. <laughs> he's, he's a good high ball hitter. <laughs> How about this? He's just a good hitter. <laughs> he's a good hitter. <laughs> Turn all the cards over. That's right. <laughs> two balls and two strikes. Only one out. And Fisher's pitch is not close. So now he's got to come in with something. Burke has only grounded into one double play all year. And again, a good job by a Tennessee hitter fouling off a two strike pitch. Burke definitely seen the ball well this weekend. I mean, that's that's a drum we've been beating all weekend on the foul balls with two strikes. I mean, Tennessee has been doing that since driving pitch count up, first having game, yeah. you know eight to ten pitch at bats, and then getting on base after. You know, quality at bats are yes, seeing a bunch of pitches, but you also have to see results at the end. And that one just missed. I'm not sure where, but Chris Smith says. It was somewhere off the plate, and Tennessee is going to get their fourth run of the inning. Wow. That looks like it cut diagonally across the plate. Well, and look at where he is set up. And, again, you look at umpires, and everybody's got different style. I know Donay's big, so you're trying to get an angle there. But it seems like if you're set up in the other batter's box, it's going to be really tough to see the other side of the plate. Here's Billy Amick pops up the first pitch. In foul territory, Heyman's going to try to get it, but it'll be into the seats. Well, it seems, you know, to be the tendency of umpires where they always set up on the inside part of the plate because it's the hardest to see. Hamick misses that breaking ball. With the bases loaded, he's hitting 500 this year, so a couple of guys that have done a lot of damage have come up with the volunteers in prime position to score more. The 0-2 is fouled back. They just spoil pitch after pitch. And really good pitches, too. And that's, that's the demoralizing part to a pitcher. I, I've talked to pitchers all the time where you foul those off. Like, all right, just get a hit already. Just get, oh, I don't want to throw 10 more pitches, then give up a hit. Get a hit now. And Amick will do that again. And once again, that pitch is just dotted yep. on the downside of the zone, outer outer corner of the plate, and just spoil a really good pitch. We talked about this earlier in the year it, with Tony Gwynn. What made him such a great hitter is that fouling off so many good pitches to where he finally got one and flicked it in the left center. And as a hitter, you don't just go up there and, oh, I'm just going to spoil a bunch of pitches no. and I get a hit. No, I mean, no, it's. No, no, no. It's truly something that you have to groom yourself mentally. Like, I am comfortable being uncomfortable. This is an uncomfortable situation. I'm one strike away from striking out. You know, that's that's going to happen, but I'm not going to go up there and be timid. I'm going to go up there and just keep spoiling pitches and get the one over the plate and then do some damage with it. You know, in this scenario as a hitter, I would always go up there going, okay, I got a one-two count, but heck, the pressure's on him. Bases are loaded. He's going to get me out. That's the mindset you have to have. He's the one up there. Gripping right now, not me. Absolutely. You know, the mindset didn't really work for me, but it's it definitely can work <laughs> for other people, I promise. Another good at bat here by Amick. That was one of those pesky uh, two hole hitters. And that leadoff? No, it was always a two hole. It's, it's my, I, a little bit, but I, I enjoyed two hole over leadoff. Yeah. So Burke's all nine pitches. This will be the eighth to Amick. 
And it is hit out into the left center field gap. Ballpark will hold it. Yost will make the catch. Throw will come to third. Run will easily tag and score. That is Stark. And is now a five spot here in the inning for Tennessee. And that just the second out. Well, productive out. Got it in play. Talking about all those two strike foul balls and get it in play. So nice hit back. And whenever you put together quality at bats, you know, back to back and you stack them all together, this is what you get and you hit around in an inning. So Tennessee now up four, a seven to three game here in Gainesville. And the guy that started the inning, Kavaris Tears, will hit again. Tears walked. And what seems like about an hour ago, Caglione was still in there. Good fastball there for strike two, and they're just going to let the runner get to second base. So two more in scoring position now. And even go back to it, remember, if Evans is able to catch that ball by dryling down the right field line, this inning's completely different. Ball that was in his glove. There's a swing and a miss. Gets away from Donay, so they'll have to throw him out and don't. And two more runs are going to score. So the wheel's just falling apart for the Gators here as Donay's throw was not even in the area code of first base. And Tennessee now has a six-run lead. Yeah, the hard part about this, this is... Uh... Out number three are on the swing and miss. Out number three, and the biggest thing is you have a self-inflicted wound where you don't block it, but don't turn one mistake into two. I know you're trying to get an out, but you can't be a hero. Turns into two runs instead of one. So a seven spot for Tennessee. This is... An offense that hasn't really done much all weekend long, but they have exploded here with the help of some mistakes by the Gators. Here's Dryling. He'll take strike one. Dryling is the one who hit that ball down the right field line. It was just fair. Evans had a long way to go get it. Dove hit off the edge of his glove, trickled into foul territory, and then that would be it for Cags. Slater couldn't get anybody out. And now Kate Fisher is working on a 27 pitch inning. And that one misses. Swing and a miss there will even up the count. Three balls and two strikes. Or bring it full. Dryling's got a single and a double. And his 51 ribbies are more than anybody else on this team. And he'll stay alive. I don't know if we have a number on it and now we're going to get it, but how many two-strike foul balls have they hit this weekend? It's just been incredible. It's got to be somewhere, what, between 50 and 60, I would think. And that one will miss. So another walk, 30 pitches now for Fisher in the inning. And the 12th man to come to the plate will be Dean Curley. Curley had a big hit and another two strike hit earlier this inning. Slater had gotten ahead of him. No balls and two strikes. Tried to throw him another slider and he hit it right back up the middle. Mm -hmm. 
Perlin was so good a year ago for the Gators. Just hasn't been able to be the same guy this year. And at this point, Tennessee's pitcher needs to start staying loose somehow. I mean, he's he's been in the dugout for a really long time. And I think he went back to the hotel and got some spa treatment. I come back with a pedicure. <laughs> When's the last time you got one? No oh, wonderful. Are you kidding me? They do wonders, huh? Yeah, man. Base runners get petties. No doubt it. Never really was a base runner. 2-2 <laughs> two -two is hit hard. That's going to find left field. Yost will pick it up. They're going to send the runner. Throw is up the line, though, and it's another run and another RBI for Curley. His second hit, second RBI this inning. And it's now a 10-3 Tennessee lead. Really good teams take advantage of other teams' mistakes. Obviously, the balls are up there just swinging, getting a whole lot of hits. But whenever the Gators are making mistakes, they are most definitely capitalizing on everything that the Gators are doing. This guy has been really good tonight for Tennessee. Hunter Ensley had the big hit off the of Caglione in the fourth. Two strikes. Two outs, a double that drove in two. And then he did it again here in the six. This one out to right. Evans going back. He's still going back, and it's going to leave the yard. An opposite field three-run shot, and Hunter Ensley has seven RBI, five this inning. And the Vols have just completely opened this thing up with an 11 spot here in the sixth inning. I mean, when you're swinging it well and you're seeing it well, there's no hiding it. Two doubles and a home run for Ensley tonight. That'll okay. help the slugging percentage. <laughs> All right, the guy that waited his turn finally got it last year. Well, and, and you would think seven ribbies in a game is a lot for a team, but you've already had Billy Amick do it this year. Dean Curley had nine in a game. Wow. That was against Kansas State. That was one shy of the team record. So Ensley's three away from tying the team record. And that ball's all the way to the backstop. Gators finally have somebody up in the bullpen. This will be the 41st pitch of the inning for Kate Fisher. And finally, the last one as Villeneuve strikes out through 73 pitches in that inning. And Colby Shelton will lead things off with a line drive into right field. So he jumped on a first pitch fastball. Nate Sneed was probably taking a nap in the clubhouse during that time. So he's got to wake back up. And we'll see what the Gators can do to try to fight back into this thing. Well, we know Sneak just throws a lot of fastballs, probably, what, about 80%. But that's his job right here, just to throw it over the plate with that big lead. And Absolutely. Gator hitters have to be aware of that, too. He's not going to try to finesse you here. I mean, statistics say they're only going to get a hit at best three out of ten times. Right. Throw the ball over the middle of the plate and let your defense go to work. Here's Shellnut. 0 for 2 tonight. One of four Gators to strike out. Gators had an early 3 0 lead. But have not scored since that. And Shell not down in the count, no balls and two strikes. Shelnut this weekend, a couple of hits, two for nine. Sneed over 50 pitches now. He came in back in the third inning. And he's been good. 
Shell not stays alive on a breaking ball there. Yeah, Snead has been impressive since he's come in. Explosive arm. Extremely impressive. Never understood the pitchers looking back. Yeah, over the right shoulder. Over the right shoulder to see, you know, as I, I never pitched, but you I can't know you, see anything. You can't see anything anyway. No. You see him before you come set. Once you come set, you don't see anything. I have the answer. Okay. As a base runner, at least the non astute ones, it slows them down because it makes you think that they know what you're doing. So it, it's actually a look to keep you at bay at first base. Whether it works or not, the, the base runner is fooled. Shell not fooled with a little slider, and he will strike out for the second time today. But now that Jeff Cardoza has given out the uh, the secret, the secret right there, that you can't see anything. Yeah. Just keeps dealing with the big lead. Donay's 0 for 2, but he's had a, a good weekend. Been swinging it well of late. He'll take that one off the plate. Came in 8 for his last 15. And Donay has hit in 10 of the last 13 games for the Gators. Average is almost up to 300. That one almost got a piece of him. It's all about getting base runners right now because you got to put a crooked number up, get back in this thing. And Sneed can't find it. Start coming out and saying, hey, dude, look at the scoreboard. We're up 10. Throw a strike. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you need to make the Gators hit you to death because – Whenever you walk guys on base, then you start getting hits. That's when you start scoring more runs. Momentum comes. And that's just kind of how it works. You need to really just fill down the, you know, the middle of the plate. Say, here's my best stuff. Hit it. Well, the conversation didn't work. Four straight wide ones. There you go. And the Gators have a couple on with one out. And it's a tough feat coming back 10 runs and you have four at bats left. But you have to continue to chip away and give yourself a chance, a fighting chance, you know, at three four run deficit in the ninth inning anything can happen but you got to get back to it and get guys on base Heyman hitting down in the seven hole today has popped up twice once to first and once to the catcher and he'll take a fastball off the plate for ball one bottom part of the order has really done nothing tonight. Five, six, seven, eight, and nine have not recorded a hit for the Gators. This one out to right, but the new right fielder, Chapman, is going to run it down. Shelton will tag, so he'll make it over to third base, but now two outs here in the inning. And now Hayden Yost will try to get his first hit of the weekend. Had a five game hitting streak coming into the weekend. Nine for 15 in that streak, but 0 for 10 so far against Tennessee. Man, a really good series against Arkansas. Yep. And that continued into the midweek game against mm -hmm. FAU. That one chopped to the first baseman, but foul. Off of the foot in the box. Yost lays off a 96 there. Steen trying to get him to chase, but he doesn't. 
Yost has driven in just one run all year, so we'll see if we can get Shelton in and eliminate the 10 run deficit. That one right off the end of the bat. And yeah, nice job by David down there. What's impressed me about Snead, 100 miles an hour on his 65th pitch. And he'll get Yost at 94 in the gear as well. So he just does everything. Yeah, he is the Swiss Army knife. To me, it's a comp of Charlie Colbertson in the MLB. Mm -hmm. Played for a very long time. Obviously can pitch, play middle infield. He's an outfielder. He's played and started a few times out there this year. And now with the catching in injury to Tanner Garrison, they definitely need to fill that with both Donay and, and Heyman playing every single day too. So, yep, he definitely is a Swiss Army knife. And... You know, a guy that really just had been begging Kevin O'Sullivan to do something. And they know that he's got a nice arm and he's pitched in the past. So tried him out there one day when the relievers were struggling and he's done a good job. He's a nice sharp slider. And we'll see if he can have a clean inning here. And there's that slider, but it backs up and it is a strike to the nine hole hitter. Well. Gators down 10 here. Vanderbilt, for the second time in two days, loses by 10 to Georgia. Georgia beats them 14 to 4 today, after beating Vandy 10 to nothing yesterday. So Ooh. that Georgia squad at home has been really, really good. It's easy to play well when you have one of the best players in the country, for sure. Here's a line drive and another two-strike hit for Tennessee as Cal Stark deposits one into left field. Yeah, Charlie Condon hit another homer today. That is 32 now on the year. And we all know that Jack Caglione had nine games in a row of hitting a homer. Condon's up to six straight. He's been special up there in Athens. And not sure if that guy right there, Jack Caglione, can catch him at this point. So he's one away from the 33 that Caglione hit last year. The BB core record. And he's, he's still guaranteed, what, about 12, 14 games left in mm -hmm. post count postseason. Can hit that the way he's going, hit that 40 mark. Christian Moore up there, and he'll foul that one off. So he's behind in the count 0 and 2, but Moore's probably saying, hey, that's right where I want it. <laughs> the yeah, way Christian Moore's saying that we're playing in Tennessee and we make a run in the postseason. I can do it too. You talk about shifts. They want to put like seven guys in center field against this. Well, they did that with Condon at, at A&M. This one is hit well to right. Evans drifting back, but he's going to run out of room, and that's into the Gator bullpen. So Moore with his 21st homer of the year, third straight at bat with a hit. And Tennessee has put up 15 now on the Gators. He is as advertised. Saw him his freshman year, and I went, wait a minute, who is this guy? And he's just gotten better every year. And highly coveted come draft time, one would think. Just tried to challenge him with a fastball. And swing oppo. And, you know, he's a really great player now, but to, to see him over his, his three years at Tennessee and the way he's matured physically, mentally, Obviously, you can see by his body. If you were to look at, you know, side-by-side -side pictures of his freshman year and his, his junior year now, he has put on a lot of strength and a lot of muscle, and really morphed his body in the weight room. Done a lot of good things. He hit the big home run here his freshman year. Two years ago. That's yeah, right. in 11th inning. Blake Burke in there. Some other scores from around the league. Uh, big series is in Kentucky this weekend. Arkansas and Hagen Smith got the best of Kentucky yesterday, but they rebound in a big way. And Kentucky puts a whooping on the Razorbacks 11 3 today to even up that series as Burke hits one hard the other way. And that ball's going to get out. So the two best home run hitters in Tennessee history have gone back to back. It's the 48th for Moore. The 45th career for Blake Burke. 
And Landon Russell's not fooling anybody. Well, they also went back to back at Kentucky a few weeks ago. So those guys do that a lot, and Burke knew it immediately. It's just a matter of how far it was going to go. So you look at now the race for the SEC. Of course, Florida won that last year, and there's the, the fur that the players get. Yeah, that's something they've been carrying around for a couple of years. Yep, did the jacket a few years ago, and you could actually walk out onto the field and, and the hat, put it on. The yep. pink hat. And, and the story in the pink hat, they, they bought it at a like a truck stop and brought it in and became part of their routine that they do. This one's hit pretty well by Amick out to right center field, but the ballpark will hold it, and Evans will run it down for the first out of the inning. So you would think with a... 13 run lead Tennessee would win this game and that would bring them to 17 and 7 now in SEC play one of those two teams are going to lose tomorrow either Arkansas or Kentucky so they'll drop to 17 and 7 and then the winner will be 18 and 6 so Tennessee at worst is just going to be one game out of the SEC mm -hmm. race after this weekend yeah with two weekends to go that one fouled straight back Tennessee goes to Vandy next weekend and then they'll finish at home against South Carolina and Vanderbilt is a much different team absolutely at home at on home. the road. Kavar's tears hits one foul. I know looking back on it Tennessee is definitely going to wish they took care of business on the Gators yesterday. Super tough to win two games and a doubleheader on a in one day but I know I mean maybe you know down the road playing a Vandy team at home very tough and then South Carolina's as hot as anybody right now too and they're playing really good baseball so that's I, it's going to be tough it's going to be a, definitely going to be a race like, like the Kentucky Derby today to uh, see who wins the league this year chopper foul Missouri actually got the best of South Carolina today Missouri mm -hmm. beat South Carolina eight to three to win their seventh game is that Pimentel He's a good pitcher. For yeah. I'm, not, I don't, I'm not saying he threw. I, every time they win, I'm going. He, he yeah, he's, the guy he's out there out. throwing. Yeah. Carter Rustad is uh, the one that got the win. And there's a strikeout. So Landon Russell gets the K, his first one in SEC play. And there's two outs in the inning. Robert Satin starts to warm up in the Gator bullpen just in case. Big one going on in Baton Rouge this weekend as well with Texas A&M and LSU. I was about to say Texas A&M too. I mean, they're 15 and 7 in the league. Yep. They could finish out winning the series this weekend as well. Dropped one last night, but very could easily find themselves winning the league as well. So there's there's four teams right now that could end up winning this thing. Ariel Antigua is a pinch hitter here. We've seen him as a pinch runner in each of the first two games and then he stayed to uh, play he's a Florida native from West Palm just a freshman he's hitting for dryling interesting I was looking at the box Pimentel only threw a third of an inning on the start today gave up a hit two walks struck out a guy so I don't know if he got hurt or what happened there that's odd the best starter Another two strike pitch fouled off the yeah, LSU with a big win yesterday but you look at where LSU is record wise and a team that won the national title they're just eight and 14 so two games even worse than what the Gators are it just shows you year in and year out it's really really tough to be consistent. I mean you look at Mississippi State a few years ago and after they won it they were mm -hmm. 500 in the league and 500 overall. Ole Miss did the exact same thing down year and then LSU long long time such a uh, phenomenal crew that works really hard and brings you the, the best of the best when it's all said and done we got Trey up here next to us in the booth as well Gators got a pinch hitter up there Blake Brookins 
So all four of those that we showed you, double duty today. They've got to be tired after the okay. doubleheader yesterday. Certainly uh, earning the uh, the Pepsis that they get for bringing you the broadcasts. Brookins will go down. Good fastball again as Nate Snead is still out there for Tennessee, and he's just pumping strikes. Three innings so far of relief. They have not used that many pitchers this weekend. I'll tell you, the relief pitching for Tennessee this weekend has not been talked about enough. No, A.J. Causey was amazing. I was With, talking to Tony Vitello about it. I said, what that guy did yesterday was crazy. Five innings, four hits, no runs, seven strikeouts. Armando so Albert's going to hit. Obviously, he's a starter. Sure. But, uh, by trade. I mean, they use an opener. But regardless, that is a relief appearance, and he did an unbelievable job yesterday, and it's not stopping right now. Well, and that's what really helps their numbers. You look at what they did against Missouri last week in their sweep of Missouri. Bullpen allowed just one run over 13 innings. So that's an earned run average of .69. And they struck out 11. So back-to-back -back weekends. And that have certainly is uh, is aided by that uh, that duo when you get A.J. Causey in there doing his thing. And Causey has been special over the last four weeks. He, he moved into the bullpen during the LSU series. And his earned run average is under two. And they've only used five relief pitchers the entire weekend. And a guy like Dylan Loy only threw one third of an inning. Mm -hmm. And Co Combs threw one inning. And I was talking to Tony Vitale. I said, that, that combo that you do with uh, Causey, he goes, yeah, we're going to keep riding that. Grounder to short, gobbled up by the shortstop, Antigua. And he will throw across for out number two. Well, this is a 10-run a rule game, so the Gators now down to their last out as Dale Thomas will come to the plate, and this is the, uh, the last time that we may get to talk to B.T. Ryapel, who has joined the broadcast this year. B.T., I, I know, you know it was probably a lot of fun being down there, getting harassed by umpires and <laughs> fans and having fun with, uh, with visiting teams, but we've certainly loved having you up here in the booth. Yeah. And we want to wish you the best of luck with the wedding. Thank you. God bless you and, and enjoy that, yeah. that chapter of your life. Yeah, this has been a, a really cool experience. Truly appreciate the opportunity. I know Sean got it started, but all you guys on board and our producer Scott Snyder got me on board and it's been super fun. Hope to join you guys next year as well. But uh, yeah, it's been a great, great experience up here. So I appreciate it. Yeah, I and mean, you get to talk baseball, man. Oh, and, that's easy. And you certainly know the game. That's uh, an easy thing to do. As Dale Thomas is up there trying to keep things alive. And, you know, I, I guess it's more mellow up up here than uh, being down there in the uh, the heart of all the action. <laughs> a little but bit more mellow for sure. When you get to, uh, to step away from it and, and just watch baseball and talk about it for a living, it's a really darn good thing. And that's a really good relief effort by Nate Sneed. He will finish off the game, goes five innings.
than we really are. Four, five, and six here for the Tennessee Volunteers. Gators trying to beat Tennessee in a series for the second straight year. Got them a couple of times in Knoxville. And a first pitch is strike one to Kavaris Tears. 0 for 2. He has grounded to third and flown to center. This will be the 85th pitch for Caglione. And it's a breaking ball that misses off the plate. Last time that Caglione went this long was the very end of March. Five and two-thirds against Mississippi State. Longest outing of the year was seven when he only gave up one run over seven innings in Baton Rouge. Two one pitch is grounded foul and BT I'm sure that that start meant a lot to him after what happened at the end of the year last year. Yeah absolutely obviously you know as the last game of the year didn't have the start that he wanted um, but you know really went in there and took it personal for himself and went out there and threw really well in Baton Rouge and has done that consistently throughout the entire year. Obviously, you know, right now in this game specifically, ran his pitch count up a little bit two innings ago, had a quick inning last inning. To be able to come into the six right here with a very, you know, bullpen that was heavily used yesterday in 18 innings that they played. So it was great for him. He needs to go out here and, and shut down right here. Well, he tries to throw a change up to tears and it misses off the plate. So it will be a leadoff walk. But I, I think that has been the difference. I think everybody knows his talent and everything that he can do, swinging a bat or throwing a baseball or even fielding a baseball. But the, the mind is, is such a big part of things. And his mindset, his ability to forget about the previous pitch or the previous whatever has been incredible this year. Here's Dylan Dryling. And Dryling hits one well down the right field line. Evans trying to chase it down, dives, and it's off of his glove. And it'll be a fair ball, says the first base umpire. So that's going to be a double, and the balls all of a sudden have second and third with nobody out. It's a heck of an effort by Evans right there. Really tough ball. I mean, the outfield shaded a little bit more to the left side with an inside-out hitter and dryling, but yeah. yeah, caught it and touched it inside the baseline. He had for a his double glove right there. too. I mean, he, he had 